so dear students today we are doing the second part of this lesson of this poem in the bazaars of hyderabad in our previous class we discussed the three stanzas the first three stanzas of this poem where we see that the poet has gone to an indian market and she see, meets different types of merchants the sellers uh, and she asks them what they were selling and they replied that they were selling the different um, wares like the merchants were selling the turbans tunics mirrors and daggers then she meets the vendors and the vendors were selling the saffron lentil and rice then she finds the maidens who were grinding sandalwood henna and spice and she finds the peddlers who were calling out the trade of chessmen and ivory dice then she walks on to find the goldsmiths who were making different gold ornaments like a wristlet and anklet and ring and bells for the feet of blue pigeons then they were making the girdles and scabbards so today we will go to the concluding two stanzas of this poem so now <clears throat> i wanted to go through the stanzas at least once so that you understand nicely what they uh, the poet dis discusses or describes in these two stanzas <clears throat> well uh, now in the third stanza the poet says What do you cry, O fruitman? She finds the fruitman, that is fruit sellers, and asks them what they were calling or shouting to sell. And they replied her that they were selling citron, pomegranate, and plum. Citron is a kind of lemon-like fruit, and pomegranate and plum you are already familiar with. You know what they. So they were selling these three items. and it doesn't mean only they were selling the three items it may mean they were selling different types of fruits then she meets the musicians in the market you may be uh, a little astonished because in the market you do not always find the musicians but in those times in the olden times there was a single market where all types of sellers used to come so even the musicians were there and finding the musicians the poet asks them what do you play o musicians sitar sarangi and drum and they reply hard that they were selling they were playing the sitar sitar means in bengali we say shatar an instrument <coughs> indian instrument with a long neck and two sets of metal strings and they were playing sarangi and drum and these were not only for playing they were also selling these musical instruments so in the bazaar or in the market even there were musicians to sell their musical instruments what do you chant o magicians spells for aeons to come and then she finds the magicians even they were also in the bazaar and she finds them they were chanting chanting means singing something like a mantra hmm. like the mantra they were chanting spells for aeons to come means they were invoking the magical power for an eternal time to come thousands of years in the extremely long period of time to come and then she moves on and finds that there were some flower girls who were weaving garlands and she goes on to asks them to she ask them what do you weave o ye flower girls with tassels of azure and red crowns for the brow of a bridegroom chaplets to garland his bed sheets of white blossom new garnered to perfume the sleep of the dead and they reply her that they were weaving some garlands that is the tassels of azure and red azure means a bright blue color so the tassels tassels means tuft of thread on which the flowers were weaven <coughs> woven and they were these flowers were of bright blue and red color and they were making these beautiful garlands as crowns for the brow of a bridegroom here you need to know that during our indian marriages the 
bridegroom, that is the boy who is getting married, wears a kind of crown on the head. In Bengali we call it mukut. That they wear on the head, both the bride and the bridegroom. And these flower girls were weaving garlands or they are making these crowns to be worn by the bridegroom on his brow. So this is a very happy occasion when during the marriage the bride and the bridegroom they wear these floral crowns and the flower girls are making garlands for such happy occasions. Then chaplets to garland his bed. They were also making chaplets. Chaplets means circle of flowers worn on the head. It's a circle of flower on the head and these are also garlands and these garlands are for what purpose? To decorate the bed of the couple that are going to be married. So his bed, his bed here refers to the bed of the bridegroom. So it's a happy occasion of marriage where they are preparing or making these garlands to decorate the bed of the bridegroom and also they were making the crowns to be worn by the bridegroom on his brow. Sheets of white blossom new garnered to perfume the sleep of the dead. Not only they were making these garlands for the bridegroom, but they were also making garlands of white blossom. White blossom means white flowers. New garnered. New garnered means it is newly or freshly collected, obtained. So they have collected fresh white flowers, blossoms means flowers, white flowers to perfume the sleep of the dead. Here also you know that whenever people die, what do we do? We cover the dead body with the white flowers that also prevent the any bad odor that comes out of the body and we also uh, burn incense sticks and cover the body with white flowers that also emits fragrance. So that is a custom in almost all the religions, say Hinduism or Islam or Christianity, everybody does the same thing, that is covering that body with white flowers. And they were preparing garlands for the dead person also. That is, the flower girls are here preparing flowers for two occasions. One is very happy and the other is very sad. The happy occasion is the marriage and the sad occasion is the death. In both the occasions we need flowers and so they are making floral garlands. So I hope you understood this poem. There is nothing to be uh, difficult for you. Now you have to go through the rhyme scheme of the poem. Suppose we take the second stanza and if we try to find out the rhyme scheme, you see vendors, maidens, peddlers, these rhyme are the rhyming words and rice, spice, dice is the rhyming word. So what we, we can say that the rhyme scheme of this poem is vendors A, rice B, then again maidens A, spice B, peddlers A, dice B. So A, B, A, B, A, B is the rhyme scheme of most of the stanzas you will find here. If you find the second also, third stanza, goldsmiths, pigeons, dancers are rhyming words, then ring, wing, king. These are the rhyming words. So again here A, B, A, B, A, B is the rhyme scheme. So you need to go through the poem, learn all the difficult words, their meanings and also learn the poem. And now we will discuss a particular aspect of the poem. You see, it's a very beautiful description of uh, Indian Bazaar and this description is actually uh, made more uh, vibrant and attractive by the poet using imagery. So imagery you know you need to know is actually creating an image in front of our eyes with the help of a few words. So when the writers or the poets they compose they try to create certain concrete images in front of our eyes that is we call imagery. Suppose when, when after going through the poem you will understand how the Indian bazaar looks like and you get a concrete picture of the poem in front of you. So here we will see the imagery is not only of the visual imagery but there are also other imageries, the imageries of say sense, then touch, smell, taste, all these. So let us first take up the visual imagery. 
the imagery that we can see with our eyes these are created by the vibrant colors like silver crimson purple amber blue azure red and white so many colors the poet has used in different um, items suppose you see the turbans are of crimson and silver tunics are of purple color uh, then then you find the lentil rice these have also their own colors you know and then uh, in the next <coughs> golden ornaments they all have the golden luster and then the fruits you see citron pomegranate plum they have also different colors so the use of color is very uh, important in creating the visual imagery in the poem you can also uh, have a visual imagery when you uh, when you try to think about the fruit seller selling different kinds of fruit or the gold uh, goldsmith making different kind of ornaments these are all visual imageries then come to the second that, that is the olfactory sense that is the sense of smell and we can get the sense of smell or our sense of smell is stimulated by the use of fragrances like the sandalwood henna and spice they have all their pungent and uh, sometimes very uh, sweet fragrance and the different smell of flowers and the garlands produced by the flower girls then we get the auditory image that is the image of hearing imagery of hearing and that is created by the playing of the sitar sarangi and drum and chanting of the magical spells by the magicians then we get the uh, sense of taste and this we can uh, have after reading the portrayal of the fruits like lemons pomegranates plums then our staple indian food like the lentil and rice all these things create our sense of taste and lastly the sense of touch is created by the bells made for the blue pigeons so in that way the poet has touched upon all the five senses of the human body to describe the splendor of the indian traditional bazaar and another thing is that this bazaar is uh, the poet has also taken us back to the past times this bazaar is not of the present time it is of the past time when there used to be kings and warriors and uh, uh, zamindars and all so and the bazaar also was concentrated uh, in a place where even the musicians and magicians and the fruit man and the goldsmiths all uh, accumulated together so this was the picture of the ancient bazaar that you will find in this poem so okay that this is all for this class i think you will now understand it clearly in our next class we will take up another lesson meanwhile you try to go to the poem its word notes and try to learn the question answers that i had already given you and also be prepared for that questions that may come from inside the lesson i remember you are in class 8 now so if you uh, if you just waste time in your computer games or watching tv and playing since there is no regular class in school so you will be in deep trouble next year when you reach class 9 then you will find that all your concepts will not help you to understand the content of class 9 in all the subjects so what i request you is that since there is not much scope nowadays for regular class we cannot hold regular classes you have to take the responsibility and think that we are all grown up and we are mature enough to understand our responsibilities so you have to go through your lessons very critically try to understand your in your own way and if you don't understand anything you can also uh, contact us and we will be giving you videos video lessons explaining the topics okay in this way we have to proceed since the situation demands uh, the this procedure so we can't help you have to adjust with this we are all adjusting but one thing i would like to tell you is that don't waste your time at all because class 9 is going to be different and uh, with the coming of the new uh, education policy if it is implemented next year then you will find a lot of changes so try to concentrate more on understanding rather than your uh, learning things by heart your concept is more important than your memory okay so please try to give importance on these and try to go through your texts very thoroughly and i will be giving you all the lessons i think all the teachers have already given you the second term course and i have started i'll be giving you almost every day one discussion on the different chapters and in this way we'll proceed so today let us wind up here and wishing you all the best See you in my next class.